Okay, we're going to start looking at, or we're starting our new series. It's uh, in the Psalms, we've called it Worship in the Psalms. It ties in really well with our J1 midweeks, which are called <coughs> Worship Matters. And in Worship Matters, we're using some uh, materials from the States. Uh, a, lead, a worship leader called Bob Corflin has produced uh, some videos. He's called them the Video Intensives. So, uh, yeah, get ready for the video intensives. We, we have a, a short video clip in each of our Tuesday nights. But we've started at those, we took, looked at the things to begin with called the important things. Heart and mind. Our hearts and our minds in worship. And this psalm that we were looking at this morning very much uh, supports and keeps that theme. So we're going to be looking at Psalm 24. And I've asked Emma if she'll come and read for us Psalm 24. Psalm 24, the King of Glory, a Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up to his soul, to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Thank you, Emma. Um, sometimes when you're watching uh, TV or a, a Netflix series, it starts off with a little advisory or a warning note, uh, just at the very beginning of the, uh, the series. Uh, and I feel like uh, it actually might be uh, necessary to have a, a little warning or advisory note as we begin to look at this psalm. Because if we get the message and the understanding of this psalm right this morning at Junction 1, it's just possible that we might see some dancing breaking out in our church. I can see my wife looking a little worried. I'm excited, actually. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe you've seen, she's, seen me, she's seen me dancing, so that might be it. I'll part with Sarah on the way. <laughs> but don't worry, because if it does happen, then this morning we can say it's going to be biblical. And also I'm sure that Matthew and Joel will, uh, will accompany us as well, so it will be good. So we're going to look at this great psalm of worship. And uh, Psalm 24, I'm going to begin by just a word about the historical context. And uh, it's written by David, a psalm of David. There's some fantastic psalms in the 20s. So Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and here we are with Psalm 24. And they're just brilliant. But here we are, Psalm 24, it's a psalm of David. It doesn't tell us about the occasion that David wrote this psalm, but biblical scholars generally, they see this psalm set around a particular event in David's life. And it's the occasion of the bringing of the Ark of Covenant to Jerusalem. And it's a story that you can read in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, and I think it's in 1 Chronicles as well. And just to remind you of what happened, initially... David had decided that he needed to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, being taken by the Philistines, and so he set up and made his plans. And in the plans to bring the Ark back, he made some great, he was going to make this a great event. And uh, it was going to be brilliant. He was going to bring the Ark back. Now remember that the Ark, with the cherubim that were over it, they symbolised to everybody the very presence of God. However, it appears that in his plans, he didn't actually stop and pause and think to follow all of God's instructions. 
They tossed the ark into a cart pulled by oxen. But God had given instructions that the ark should only be carried on the poles by the priests. And as the, the cart goes forward, the oxen stumble. It looks like the ark is going to fall. And one of the priests there, Uzzah, reaches out his hands and grabs hold of the ark to stop it falling. And at that very moment, he falls and dies before the Lord. I'd always felt a little sorry for Uzzah. I thought, well, that's what I would do. But you see, it appears that it wasn't only David who had ignored all the instructions that God gave, but the priests as well. And so the message, if you like, was clear. The message was clear. God is holy. You cannot just casually come into his presence and choose to do it in your own way. David initially was angry. But then we read in uh, Samuel that he was afraid. And he feared the Lord. And he says, I cannot bring the ark back. And he places it instead in a house of a person who's there called obed Edom. And so this psalm expresses two questions from David. And the first one is this. Who is this God? Who is this God who has come to live and to presence himself amongst us as his people? Who is he? And then the second question that comes in this psalm is, who do we need to be in order to live in his presence? And so this psalm then is about our relationship to God and how we respond to him. And there is nothing, there's nothing that's more important. This literally is a life and a death issue. And so we're going to look at this psalm with that historical context as David wrote it. And the first part of the psalm, and in fact the very end of the psalm, verses 1, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. So the psalm begins and it ends with a statement about who God is. And it says that God is the creator. He is the one who made the world and he made everything in it. And because he made everything, then everything belongs to him. Everything belongs to God. You and I belong to God. God hasn't borrowed or taken something from someone else. See, God reigns over everything that he's made. And the psalm ends with this uh, verse in verse 10, giving God the title, the Lord of hosts. So Israel and David, as the anointed king, of Israel, have a very special relationship with God. But actually, the psalm begins and ends with an emphasis that um, this isn't just the God of Israel or the God of David. He is the God of the whole world. Not just David, not just the people of Israel. So that's who God is, but who may come to God? So the next two verses, there is a response. So David actually asked the question. In the Chronicles uh, account of, uh, of the bringing of the ark, he says, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? And in verse 3, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Who dares, who dares to come into the presence of God? So David was wondering just exactly what does he and the people of Israel have to do? And who do they have to be? And then in, in verse 4 of our psalm, we have the answer. And there are four qualities that David speaks about in this psalm. And they're put into two pairs. It's a, a way that sometimes in Hebrew that they, they put these um, uh, balancing statements together. And so there are four qualities and they're in two pairs. And the first pair is looking firstly at the external character. It says, he who has clean hands. Now, that means that it's really referring to those who live outwardly in a way that reflects God's character. And in the Old Testament terms, this is very much about uh, caring for others, loving our neighbour. Leviticus 19 says, 
You shall not take vengeance, nor hold any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbours yourself. I am the Lord. And so having clean hands is very much about living in a way which outwardly reflects the character of God, and especially for David and for Israel in defending the cause of the fatherless and the widow. And then the second part we read in this verse is that we have pure, uh, we have clean hands, but also a pure heart. Now we have a pure heart when we love God, and we're inwardly holy. You see, our desire and our focus is always to be on God's glory. We keep his laws, and we delight in them. Now this was the refrain, if you like, all the way through the book of the law, that we should love the Lord your God with all your heart. So the first pair were the external character, the hands, and the internal character, the pure heart. And then the second pair is really focused on relationships. It says, do not lift up their souls to what is false. And that's our vertical relationship to God. That we shouldn't have as a focus for our lives those things which are empty or vain. And perhaps this uh, is particularly, well this is particularly represented in what we call the first table, the first part of the Ten Commandments. And most clearly in the Third Commandment, that we should not take the, the name of the Lord our God in vain. It's not referring principally to, um, to speaking uh, God's name and, and, and blaspheming in that way. It's actually referring to a way in which we live in a right relationship with God. We shouldn't live with our lives uh, uh, so that ourselves are at the centre and at the same time claiming to follow God and to name God. And so the vertical relationship is that we do not lift up our souls to what's false, that we put God at the centre. And then secondly, horizontal relationships, the relationships to one another says, do not swear, those who do not swear deceitfully. Now, if the first one connected to the first part of the law, of the Ten Commandments, this refers to the second part of the Ten Commandments, that we should practically do good towards our neighbour, and that we should live in a right relationship with our neighbour. And if we were to pick out the, the commandment that is most similar, it is the ninth commandment, not to bear false witness. Now, that's not just talking about lying. If we were to have a true and a just society, then we have to have justice. And this has got to be based upon truth and true testimonies. So the qualities then which describe who may come to God are put so clearly for us. Clean hands, loving our neighbour. A pure heart, loving the Lord our God. Not lifting our soul to what's false, having a life that is centred upon God and to speak the truth always. This presents us, I guess as David knew only so well, with a problem. You see, none of us display consistently these qualities. Again and again, we fall short of God's glory. We don't need to look back many years to find a fault or a slip up. You see, our hearts and our lives just do not match up to these requirements. We do not deserve to stand in God's presence. But, but, David knows something else about God. He knows that this God is a God who forgives. He is a God who is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. He loves and he cares about us and he cares for us. Moses prays in uh, recording numbers, it says, Pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love. Now, when David comes back to the house of Obed where the ark of the Lord has been uh, placed, this time, this time he comes back in faith. And he follows the instructions of the Lord. And he brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. 
And notice uh, uh, in the account that's given that every six steps that they took carrying the ark, they would stop and they would sacrifice a bull and make an offering to the Lord. And that offering was to represent the atonement for sin. And so this time when David comes and brings the ark back, he follows those instructions. And now we come to the last part of this psalm, the King of Glory. This is where you and I come into this story. This is where we come into this psalm. Now I'm going to note that uh, in the traditional Jewish liturgy, this psalm, these psalms were written for the people of God to use and the priests to use. And this psalm, Psalm 24, was traditionally always read on the very first day of the week. And it wasn't simply read, it would be designed, it was designed and used for singing and for reciting. And I want us now, from David, to fast forward 1,000 years. It is the first day of the week. It's Sunday. The priests and the rabbis are in the temple courts and they're reciting and singing the liturgy from Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. And as they're reciting these words, a king is entering the holy city of Jerusalem. This king is no ordinary king. He is riding on a donkey. He doesn't merely symbolise the presence of God as the Ark of the Covenant did. This is King Jesus, the very Son of God. And as he enters, the people are breaking off palm branches and they're laying them before him. And they're shouting another liturgy. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This king has clean hands. This king has a pure heart. He glorified the Father and perfectly accomplished the work the Father had given him. This time, no sacrifices of bulls or goats are offered because Jesus came to Jerusalem to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sin. And by his sacrifice, we are made whole. We are forgiven. Who is the King of glory? It is Jesus. And he comes into the holy place, and we by him are able to come to. He made the way. In Hebrews it says, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, securing for us eternal redemption. Jesus died on a cross, on the cross of Calvary. He was laid in the grave, but God vindicated him on the third day. He rose from the dead, and he ever lives to make intercession for us, for you and for me. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Asked the son. Who will stand in the presence of the Lord? We will. We will. We will because Jesus, the King of glory, laid down his life for us. And he took it up again. So that we in him will live forever in his presence. You know, we can spend eternity with Christ. We can be spending eternity in the very presence of God. When the ark came back to Jerusalem, it's what we read. David danced before the Lord with all his might. He was wearing a linen garment. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord, with shouting and with the sound of the horn. David could dance because he knew that God had forgiven him for his sin. He could dance because he could see that the ark, representing God's presence, was coming back. We too, in a much clearer way, in a much stronger way, we can know God's forgiveness. Our joy is even more 
Because you see, he looked forward and he could only see dimly into this King of glory. But we see Jesus. We see Jesus, the King of glory. The King of our heart. You know, I hope we are dancing this morning. We might not be leaping around right now, physically, but we should be in our hearts because the King of glory has come. David's wife saw him dancing and she, she rebuked him. And David said, I was dancing before the Lord. You know, we shouldn't care if someone looks at us and tells us we've lost our minds or we're crazy. David danced before the Lord. We too dance before the Lord. He has made the way. The King of glory has come. Praise God for Jesus. We're going to be taking communion together. What a, a great way. What a great way. <coughs> Open our own gates of our life and let Jesus, the King of glory, in. What a picture that is of God coming, his presence with us. And the sacrifice, remember, the sacrifice has been made. We are not worthy, but we are made worthy by the blood of Jesus. This morning, we have salvation Jesus, and it should make us dance. Praise God. Praise God.